churches series of Zoom lectures. Uh, we run them each year, we've run them for the last three years now, from November to March and monthly. And I do hope that you know you would enjoy them. You get all of the details of them by looking at the Yorkshire Historic Churches Trust uh, website. And uh, I'm very keen the fact that these talks are all free um, and they are not just exclusively for Yorkshire Historic Churches Trust people. Uh, anybody else, so if you want to spread the word to your friends, anybody is welcome to join them. Uh, if you feel so inclined, uh, we would obviously welcome a small donation. And at the end of the talk, I will give sort of very brief instructions on how you can do it comparatively easily. Uh, it does sound a little bit complicated when I explain it, but in fact, it is uh, actually uh, quite easy. <laughs> so the uh, person that you're coming to hear today is not me, but Roger Button. And I know that former Art Fund members will remember him because he came to a good many of the uh, events. Uh, he was in, as I like to call it, real life, uh, a civil engineer, uh, but uh, he tells me he was always interested in William Morris and his circle, and he has always been very interested in woodwork. It was his favorite subject at school. So he might be a man to come round to do a bit of joinery for you in his time. <laughs> um, he did, uh, he was introduced to the arts and crafts meeting um, movement through his interest in William Morris. And to his amazement, he discovered that nobody had actually written a book on the arts and crafts of the churches that had been influenced by the arts and crafts movement. So he decided to spend his or part of his retirement a retirement project writing a book on it and here it is uh, it's an excellent book uh, full of illustrations and lots of uh, interesting facts so, but uh, I'll now I won't say you know without further ado because everybody used to say that on every <laughs> zoom talk so I'll pass it over to Roger who can now start screen sharing, we hope. Okay, Roger. Thank, thank you, Moira, for the introduction. I will um, endeavour to share my screen. Uh, share. Uh, that. Does that, can you all see a screen that's my, my yes, yes. opening screen? Yes, Excellent. absolutely. Good. <laughs> so the place of the arts and crafts movement. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. No one said yeah. no, so I'll I'll carry on. So um, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with with the arts and crafts movement and what it was all about. But it's so that you know what I'm talking about in the talk, I'll just run through what I think are the most important features of it, and we'll see how they relate to the churches that I'm going to talk about. So the, the I suppose we we have to begin. It is arts and crafts after all. So the perhaps the most important feature is. The, the, the virtues of hand craftsmanship, making things by hand rather than churning them out in some industrial process. And um, that these ideas go, go way back into the, before the Industrial Revolution. Um, uh, I, and I suppose um, John Ruskin was the one who perhaps uh, was the main person who, who promoted this idea. Uh, not only would you get a much more attractive product, but the the people making them would get much more job satisfaction out of actually doing something by hand, something that they had themselves uh, been responsible for. So the, the, the second point is that um, rather than producing mass producing something designed by somebody else, you would get much more job satisfaction if you had designed it yourself from scratch. And if it was something original, not, not just a copy of something else or following the current fashion. So going on from there, the, the a key feature of the arts and crafts or rationale is that form follows function, that you make something to suit the convenience of the user rather than just um, you know, the, the current fashion of the time. Um, and then we would use uh, nature 
as a source of decoration. We, we're all familiar with the William Morris wallpapers and fabrics, and of course the designs are all based on um, natural forms, uh, uh, leaves and flowers and uh, <clears throat> birds and so on. Um, then it's also that they always felt it was important to keep to the vernacular and traditional styles of, of an area rather than importing uh, novel ideas from outside. So, you you know, they wouldn't recommend going off on, on the grand tour and bringing back some classical fashion. You you should look and see what's around you and, and build on that. The, then there was the idea that uh, you would get much more job satisfaction if you cooperated with people rather than were in competition with them. Um, and William Morris, of course, well, regarded himself as more important as a uh, a socialist than almost than as a designer. Then on this, the final thing here is promoting the role of women. And um, even in, in years gone by, perhaps women didn't get the, the credit they deserved. There's a new book out on uh, William Morris and his wife. And uh, I think we now all appreciate that uh, Jane and May Morris had much more input into the Morris style than had hitherto been recognized. When we were talking about buildings in particular, rather than just artifacts or fabrics and wallpaper and so on, there's the, the, the crucial point of the using local materials because these will uh, blend in, your, your, your buildings will look at home. We, so the, the, the next point is that, you, you know, you, you think about the context and the setting of your building, you're a good neighbour to the buildings around you and, and you think about the landscape or the townscape setting so that your your, your building is is set in its context. I talk a little bit about Scotland and of course Scotland has always been a little bit different from, from here and one of the key things was that while the arts and crafts movement was flourishing in England, up in Scotland they were they had other things on their minds, in, in particular they were thinking about a but building a sort of Scottish national tradition uh, based on the ideas of um, Walter Scott and things like that. So th th there was always a different emphasis in Scotland. And whereas in England, we talk about William Morris being a, a, a keen socialist and, and wanting to uh, put people to be regarded as sort of equals, um, in, in Scotland, that the, the idea more was that if we educated people, they, they would all be levelled up and we could all be equal as a result of um, improving our, our lot in life. And for, finally, in Scotland, there was this idea that we should provide public art, which, again, wasn't really something that um, was, was a feature of, of England. OK, so that's the background. Sorry to have rambled on, but uh, I think it's important that we all know where we're coming from and what we're talking about here. So if you live in or near York, you, you will be aware that uh, these sort of activities go on. We have horror, historical reenactments and you can uh, start with the, the Romans and or you could become a, a Viking historical reenactment. Or, of course, if you're a church person, then you you reenacted a historical medieval church. This is this is our church at St. Olives. And at the end of the 19th century, it went at full speed into um, historical reenactment mode. The um, and what I'm going to look at here is uh, compare two churches that where the situation was very similar. One went down the conventional sort of medieval uh, Gothic revival route, and the other one went down the arts and crafts route. So here we are in Norton, and he here is. Can you see my little cursor moving? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. Here is the here is the old where what what was the old church in 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 Norton, so not surprisingly on Church Street, uh, quite a, a, a really a, a, quite a small site and a, an old I think an 18th century church sort of squashed in there. At uh, Brampton in Cumbria we had a similar situation. Here was the old church on a on a quite a congested site. Here it's in Front Street, but it's the same idea, pretty but very similar scale and proportions and very similar sized towns. And of course, as the 19th century progressed, the populations grew and uh, people wanted larger and grander churches. So 
In Norton, they went down the conventional route and they had this church designed for them um, by uh, Hodson Fowler, who was a disciple of George Gilbert Scott. And, you know, a very fine, a very fine church. You, you can't really fault it, except that it is what it is. It's a copy of a, an imaginary medieval church. And it, there it is completed. Uh, and the trouble is, it's right. It's, they had to build it on the edge of town because they wanted the all of the trappings of a, uh, of a, a medieval church um, with uh, chancel and all, all the uh, chapels and so on. And, and so it wouldn't fit on the site. So here they are on the edge of town and it, it's rather out of context and it's um, it, it just doesn't it doesn't form the, the focal point of the community that that perhaps it should. Whereas in Brampton, they went the other way. This was what I claim is the first arts and crafts church. It was squeezed in on the existing site and here it is still in the center of town and at the focus of the community. And that I think is how things that should have been done. Um, that's the site of the old church in Norton. It's just a rather, just a little park now and it's the entrance to the swing. What, what a missed opportunity when you could have had a, an arts and crafts church here in the middle of Norton anyway. That's water under the bridge, as they say. So what happened is, so here is here's our church in St. Olives in York, and this is where everybody was in the in the 19th century. It's the old sort of 18th century preaching box um, plan. But towards the end of the 19th century, they decided they had to go down the historical reenactment route. So they added on chapels and chancels and sacristies and an organ and everything else, the full, the full historical reenactment. Uh, Monty. Now we're, we're going to have a look at St Martin's Brampton. Those of you who don't know, don't know it. It's up here, just east of Carlisle. Uh, th so this was this was the very congested site that uh, the old church was on, and there was some discussion as to sh should they go and do a, a Norton and build a new church, sort of on the edge of town, um, or or would they try and accommodate something on the existing site? Fortunately for us and for the present residents of Brampton, the, the arts and crafts view prevailed. Um, the, the key patron here was the um, uh, George uh, Howard, the Earl of Carlisle, and he was offering to, to um, fund it, substantially fund it. He was a friend of William Morris. You probably know that, um, that William uh, and, uh, and Jane spent quite a lot of time up with the Howards at Nowth Castle, and they also were a new uh, the, the the architect that that they appointed, uh, Philip Webb. Uh, so Webb comes along and decide and, and looks at this site and thinks, well, I, I can make a perfectly good uh, church on this site, which will be very appropriate and for the for the people who are going to worship there. Never mind that it won't be in the currently fashionable sort of Gothic revival style. So th this is this is the plan. It, there's a sort of uh, collegiate style seating here, uh, conventional seating here. But you notice the chancel, instead of being projecting out at the east, is incorporated in the body of the church, so that the preacher and the, the uh, readers are, are in the in the middle of the body of the church. It's a much more sociable, much more communal sort of affair than the uh, Gothic revival option, um, and um, uh, Webb had some ingenious ideas here. He, he saved space. He didn't stick the vestry on the end. He, he thought, well, the, a church is usually a very high building. We've got room for some accommodation upstairs. So he puts the vestry upstairs. <laughs> and it, it's an extremely, extremely attractive building inside. Webb was very keen that the, uh, the natural light would be very good. So we, we've got quite domestic sort of dormer windows in the a south uh, roof here and then on this side we have a couple of transepts with big uh, north facing north lights that uh, give this light and of course the, we have these benches which are very comfortable you, you, you don't have to sit there sitting up to attention while the preacher preaches at you six feet above contradiction that you can relax and enjoy uh, being part of the community now of course if you're building a uh, a replica Gothic church. You have to decorate it in a, comp in a in a suitable manner. So that this is a typical window from from the period. This is St Olive's, where um, 
Saints Peter, uh, James and John are under their medieval canopies, sort of looking very, looking very medieval. So even the fa even uh, Peter's face here is quite medieval looking. So this is this is the St Peter window at St Olives, very typical late nineteenth century um, historical reenactment window. Whereas the the equivalent at Brampton is this uh, Burne Jones wind design produced by William Morris. Um, just a, it's a totally different gives a totally different feel. And of course, because the wind there's a lot of uh, clear glass, you get a much more light into the building. And it's just a different approach to how to do church. And we're talking, I was talking about the importance of craftsmanship. Here's the font and this beautifully crafted font cover. And even so it has its, has its counterbalance weight. And even, even this is sort of decorative and the weight is a decorative feature, not just a, a lump of lead. And this, this post here is simply holding up the floor for the ringing chamber above, but it's beautifully proportioned and very elegantly made, all, all thanks to Philip Webb and, and the craftsmen who are working on it. So looking at the craftsmanship of, of the font, just have a look at a few more fonts. This is a very impressive one at All Saints Brockhampton that uh, the important church will come back to later on. So this was carved by uh, William Etherby. And of course, he, he was the architect of the church as well. The whole whole point of the arts and crafts um, philosophy was that you you were hands on. You didn't just design things and let somebody else do it. If you were designing something, you, you jolly well got on with the tools and you and you helped to make it. And uh, so, so that that aspect and the, the the fact that the decoration is 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 all all from nature, uh, vines and grapes, and so that. that symbolizing the fact that uh, when we become a Christian we're grafted into uh, the life of Christ and um, so it's symbolic but it's nature and this is the way it's done. Uh, we look at another font here this is St Andrew's Roca, uh, similar situation so Randall Wells was um, Letherby's assistant at Brockhampton and went on, on to have a career in his own right and he was in, engaged on as a sort of supervising site architect up at Roker and being a hands-on arts and crafts person he not only did he produce drawings and um, superintend the work but he also had a hand in 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 carving this this font again with uh, design inspired by nature and the, the delightful little font here at Bristier over in Wales, uh, very simple, but um, do, doing all, all the right arts and crafts things. <clears throat> this, this is perhaps the most impressive uh, font of, of, of the lot. It's, it's a bit of an outlier. I, I expect many of you are aware of St Mary's Church in Rhea, uh, designed by Sarah Losh, um, so our, our first lady. Um, and and she involved the local villagers and her, her relations got her cousin to help to do the craftsmanship and again here we have this uh, very very finely decorated font uh, featuring vine leaves and other flowers and uh, the, the, even the lid is um, has uh, water lilies and things on floating on a, a mirror to make it look like water. Um, of course, this um, this this was well before the arts and crafts movement, as such, got going. So Sarah was way ahead of her time, but totally in the in the spirit of of the arts and crafts movement as it developed. So as as I've introduced um, women here, we're going to move on and have a look at another uh, woman. That's that Sarah herself, and we're going to we're going to nip down to uh, Compton in Surrey, where Mary Watts, the wife of G.F. Watts, George Watts, the very well-known late Victorian painter, um, was aware that the, the, the village needed a new burial ground, as was happening all over the country. Burial grounds were filling up, new burial grounds and cemeteries were needed. And she had this vision of providing a a very special chapel where people could go and 
uh, pay their respects uh, to their dearly beloved and um, uh, and just um, commune with with God and experience the sort of peace that came from that. And so she just she decorated it with the help of people from the village that she trained up um, with, with the theme of angels. Uh, the, the, in, on the roof here, we have the, the nine orders of angels. Those of you who know the, the famous window at All Saints North Street in York will know about the nine orders of angels. And, and here they are starting at the top of the, of the ceiling and then working their way down the, down the walls. Uh, the outside is also decorated in, in terracotta. And again, this is all done by people from the village that, that Mary trained up and, and they built a, a pottery to, to fire all these uh, tiles and bricks. And so here we have more angels looking down in sympathy and angels looking up to heaven. And the idea was that, that, that this would help to uh, make uh, the, the period of uh, grieving um, more more bearable and and she got the local blacksmith to, uh, to to make these special hinges and straps with across details on the end and and the other famous uh, arts and crafts lady of course is Phoebe Tracare from from Edinburgh so we're going to dash right up the country from the, to, to the to the north to to Edinburgh to see the um Mansfield Church, which uh, Phoebe decorated. Um, again, this is very, very well known. So I, many of you will perhaps have been there or will know about it. Um, the, the, the building was constructed by uh, a denomination known as the Catholic Apostolic Church. This was a very, very thriving denomination in the, through, through the 19th century. Um, and it clearly was a, was a move of the Holy Spirit. The ministers were all, or everybody knew that they had been called to, to serve this church and, and serve it, they did. Um, and the worship was, was something else that they used. It was very elaborate, lots of lovely music. Uh, the only problem was towards the end of the 19th century, it seemed the Holy Spirit had stopped calling people to come and minister in it. And so the whole thing rather fizzled out. But um, for Phoebe was uh, visiting the church on some occasion while, while there was a service in progress and was so impressed by the liturgy and the music she thought I really must contribute to this and, and I will do the decorations and here, here it is uh, sometimes referred to as the Sistine Chapel of, of the North um, and um, the, 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 all the models for the, the, the various characters are all members of the congregation and it's said that there are sort of arts and crafts uh, people on the north wall I'm afraid you can't see them but uh, her, her heroes like people like William Morris are the, the models for some of the other angels and, and figures I mean it's a truly astonishing feat of, uh, of decoration and that really has to be seen to be believed so while we're up in, having got to Edinburgh, we'll just slide along the coast a little way to uh, a little fishing village, as was uh, a sort of a commuter village for Edinburgh now, but called Port Seaton, where, we're, again, we find a, a feast of, of craftsmanship in in the, um, known as the Chalmers Memorial Church. Thomas Chalmers was one of the leaders of the free church when it broke away from the established <clears throat> a Presbyterian church in, in Scotland oh, oh, really it was all over the issue of who, who was responsible for appointing the ministers did the congregation choose the minister or was the minister imposed upon them by the by the laird or somebody else and um, so the free church split off and this this building was started un, under the auspices of the free church so while it was being built I think the church there was a certain amount of reconciliation and re-amalgamation and by the time the church was finished it was actually a, a, a more standard Presbyterian church. So the architect um, Sidney Mitchell and his colleague Wilson um, and a, a feast of arts and crafts decoration here again vine leaves and uh, bunches of grapes featuring prominently that uh, woodwork was 
done by a couple of brothers, the Clo brothers from Edinburgh, I think originally from Fife, but they settled in Edinburgh and did a lot of work in, in the area. Uh, in, included, this, they carved these um, little posts at the bottom of the steps up to the pulpit. This is the pelican in her piety feeding her young of her blood. And this was to remind the preacher that he was preaching uh, about Christ's sacrifice and what he did for us. On the other side of the staircase is this is this is the boat with the two disciples hauling in the miraculous catch of fish again to remind the preacher that uh, his words were going to go out and bring in a big catch. And the nice thing about this is that um, a local sculptor adopted that little tiny um, sculpture to, and turned it into a big, a big sculpture which forms the, the sort of gateway in, into the village. I suspect not many people realise that this uh, that this sculpture they come across is actually based on that tiny little one on the on the newel post on that staircase. So, um, no, so Sidney Mitchell was um, uh, just worked in Scotland, um, but there were these close links between the English and and the Scots uh, arts and crafts movement and one of the things that the arts and crafts organization such as it was uh, arranged were these that was they formed the national association for the advancement of art and its application to industry the real mouthful but uh, the idea was that um you know our, we should improve the design of everything that we made things that were manufactured buildings the, the design should be improved and we should involve craftsmen in, in, in the design process rather than just churning out mass-produced rather unattractive products. Anyway, um, the, the, they held this, the, the, that's the second Congress in Edinburgh and, and Sidney Mitchell was on the organising committee and uh, he, he would have hobnobbed with all of the key figures from the English arts and crafts movement there, William Morris right, and, and so on. <clears throat> This is the interior of the church, again decorated, uh, as we keep on repeating, in, in, a, in a, using the theme of, of nature and um, fish and birds. The it, the story goes that the um, the fishermen whose whose church it was were off fishing, but following the herring fleet down to um, <clears throat> Great Yarmouth. At, when this was being decorated and when they came back being rather severe Presbyterians they didn't approve at all of this frivolous decoration but they were reassured that, that these were this is all part of God's creation birds and fish and that the decoration was allowed to survive fortunately for us um, this is the exterior it's quite uh, quite Scandinavian in feel I, th I understand that the design evolved a bit while it was being built um, possibly the Scandinavian influence is because the, the fishermen were, it was a lot of exchange to and fro with um, Scandinavian fishermen uh, fishing in, in the North Sea. I'm not sure about that. The, um, so a key, one of the key features of the Arts and Crafts building is that the building was in context with it, in its setting, uh, use appropriate materials and, and it was sort of harmonious. So when we are, we find that Sidney Mitchell has another commission to design a church on the opposite side of Scotland, Port Ellen here on Isla, have got very different situation. This was really exposed to the to the west, what well, everything the Atlantic could throw at it, the gales and rain and salt spray. And so he designed a church that was totally appropriate for that sort of environment. This, this is the west end, almost no, no openings at all. The local stone but built very sympathetically to the to the needs of of the environment and a, a very a very cozy and um, inviting interior as well now we, I, I know i know we are yorkshire and so finally i'm going to let you come and visit a yorkshire church um it's a rather special one i don't know how many of you are familiar with it um Hawksworth Wood on the, on the western suburbs of Leeds, um, designed by uh, W.D. 
Caro in the 1930s. I'm showing you these drawings because it's actually quite difficult to get a good picture of the church. It's um, surrounded by trees and a bit, bit difficult to see. But anyway, this is what it looks like. And it does indeed look just like the drawings. Um, Carew is an interesting person. He, he was very um, sympathetic to the arts and crafts movement. He wasn't himself one of these people who, who were hands on. You wouldn't see him picking up a hammer and chisel and helping to carve something. But he, he great attention to detail and worked with particular firms of craftsmen who he knew he could trust to, to produce the, the uh, workmanship that he, that he was looking for. Um, it's quite a complex uh, plan of the church, but um, not, although it has sort of some looking back to um, medieval precedents, that the, 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 the nave is very wide, that the, these are very narrow, so there are very few seats that don't have a good view, that you're, you're not stuck behind pillars. Um, an interesting uh, sort of, uh, park close around around the chancel here and it's a, a very very attractive interior the this so this is the the screen um and or very 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 free use of of different ideas in in the design here i mean it's almost you could call it postmodern. you know there, there are sort of gothic features here and classical features here but put together in a very uh, a very very effective way so to, to get this kind of a building which you know original like this you you need a patron who is going to be prepared to sponsor it and the patron here was um Hugh Middleton Butler from the Kirkstall Forge the Kirkstall Forge was a, a huge industrial complex down on the river air um, where most of the people in the in the estates that this church serves would have worked and it, it, the forge was very busy during the First World War, manufacturing parts for military vehicles and things. It was a very, very successful enterprise. Um, <clears throat> and Mr. Butler was was keen to uh, employ Carew and the designer to have a, an original and, and interesting building. It, you might think that um, building it a flint is a bit inappropriate. You can hardly call this a, a local material. Uh, the, the story is that um, Mr. Butler's wife came from Norfolk and they both very much enjoyed those uh, those huge Norfolk flint built churches. And also that, uh, of course, the, the flint is a very good material to use in an industrial environment where there's a lot of pollution in the atmosphere. <clears throat> it's a very durable uh, finish. And indeed, you know, this is 100 years old now. and It, it really looks as as good as when it was built. So that that paid off, even though he did introduce Sort of alien materials rather against the philosophy of the arts and crafts movement. Now I'm afraid we can't resist leaving Yorkshire just to go and have a look at St Andrew's Roker. This is, is perhaps deservedly known as the cathedral of the arts and crafts movement um, and it is a magnificent building. Uh, the architect Edward Schroeder Pryor uh, did a lot of work in the sort of arts and crafts tradition. And uh, so we need a patron to, to if we're going to have a, a proper arts and crafts church. Our patron here was John Priestman, who was uh, a local uh, shipbuilder from Sunderland. He'd done extremely well during the 19th century. He realised that there was always boom and bust cycle in shipbuilding. Um, and a a lot of shipbuilders would, would would work furiously during the boom periods and then of course go bust during the bust. Well, he realized the way around this was that, well, you would build ships during the quiet periods when everything was cheap and then you would sell them during the boom and then you would wait until things were cheap again and then you'd build more. So he, <laughs> he, he did extremely well and um, he basically uh, financed this uh, St Andrews as a memorial to his parents and as a thank offering for, for all that he had been able to achieve. The amazing interior, um, but one of Pryor's particular things was, was texture, that if, if you had a good texture to a surface, you didn't need any artificial decoration. The texture alone would, would provide the interest that, that you need. And very interesting, the way the stone 
is cambered here so that it, these arches really sort of enfold you and give you a very um a, a very co compact sort of cozy feeling although the church is is huge it doesn't it doesn't feel big because you feel you're enfolded by it um <clears throat> the uh, the chancel here is that's not hidden away by a some sort of medieval screen uh the, the idea is that the the altar is very accessible. All everybody seating, uh, seated in the church can can see through to to the altar. Uh, the, 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 there's no sort of medieval mystery going on here. The the chancel is de it was decorated by uh, Max Gill, and uh, again this this is a sort of creation theme here with uh, nature being created by by God's hand. Um, the, again, in the arts and crafts sort of tradition <clears throat> the all, all it's a wonderful altarpiece it's a tapestry uh, produced by uh, the morris uh, works uh, obviously a design by uh, burn jones and again uh, <laughs> this is the visitation of the magi they they're doing it in a very rural uh, situation environment with all, all this wonderful um uh, flowers and foliage as a decoration and if you're looking for real craftsmanship, then you can do no better than come and admire the uh, chancel furniture here. Now, you're not getting a sort of uh, reproduction of some uh, Gothic medieval style that which you might find in York Minster. You're, this is plain and simple, but beautifully made and extremely elegant. And uh, if, you, if you're a fan of uh, arts and crafts silverware this this is the place to come the newcastle handicraft Com company were a, a sort of arts and crafts um uh, consortium who uh, did a lot around this period so we've we've been, we've got as far as newcastle um just going to just nip a little way up into the pennines to uh little village or hamlet really at Gunnerton. Now, <clears throat> I was saying how uh, your Arson awesome Cross Church is not designed, it's not designed to be fashionable, it's not designed to impress outsiders or to comply with any particular preconceptions of what a church should look like. Uh, and I, I always think this looks more like the village telephone exchange, but it's, it is not. This is indeed the church. And as we see when as we approach the door, um, and and this is the this is cast into the ironwork on the door um a, a, a phrase this is from psalm 122 that we're very familiar with now particularly after the last coronation the, the anthem is has been sung at every coronation since james the second i think so i was glad when they said we would go into the house of the lord and indeed we are very glad because the interior is just something else i i think this is just um, stunning. And uh, in fact, the architect, uh, John Hawes, amazing character, who can't go into his full life story, but he said that this was this was the best thing he ever did. And um, as we had seen before, the, the, there's, there's no east window. So the focus is is very much on the on the altar, which is illuminated by a, a formal window in the south wall here. Um, and it's just uh, just uh, very beautifully put together. It's tiny. It just serves a very small population, um, and uh, uh, a very interesting story is how it came to be. So the architect John Hawes, and he in 1898 he exhibited at the uh, Royal Academy summer summer show a, a model of a design for a Westmoreland church. Um, he just, I don't know, he just ha had this idea that, that he'd like to, he was working in London, that, that this would be an interesting project. And, and he made this extremely detailed architectural model. And this was this was seen by Reverend Wilfred Hornby, who was the vicar um, of Chollerton, which is the, 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 the big parish. Um, and he, he, he thought, he just realised that this was what he needed for his a sort of chapel of ease for the village of Gunnerton. So he employed John Hawes to come up to uh, Gunnerton and, um, and basically 
design and be responsible for building the church. This is and this is what he came up with. That's the old uh, delightful little baptistry on the side. I say it's tiny. It just serves this very small hamlet. Um, there, there was a, I think, a gallery at the west end, which has been converted into a, a little kitchen area because this is the only um, public building in the village. So this is used for social events as well. Uh, um, and the panelling, I think. I think I can say that this some of the panelling was carved by John Hawes himself um, while he was working up there. He could turn his hand to almost anything. He built boats when he was working in the Bahamas. He built churches and a, even a cathedral when he was working in Australia. Um, so, again, all, all uh, based on nature, a little mouse here and a bird here. And I, I believe I claim the, the only dodos in a in an arts and crafts church just delightful and um this this west the west window is this this wasn't original it was clear glass in the original design but uh it needed replacing and uh, the the uh, a sheer flash of inspiration that they came up with with this i think they had a competition and um this was the winning design it's a sort of explosion of, of god's love from the center radiating outwards it's fantastic um right now we're going to come back to yorkshire i know i know you're all dying to see yorkshire churches so um th this is um not not at all dissimilar to um gunnison um when uh, this is the old, old church at stalling busk and a, a new vicar arrived at ask creek 1905 ask creek is just is over here somewhere this is wednesdaydale this is seymour water um and Stalling Busk is a little hamlet, really, really uh, the, the most remote, I suppose, of all the arts and crafts churches. Um, Reverend Squibb arrived and decided that they really needed a proper church in the, in the little in the heart of the little settlement at uh, Stalling Busk, and um, this is what he came up with. We know very little about Gerard Davidson. His, I think, it's his only church. Uh, he went on to design that sort of arts and crafts housing. He uh, worked on um, sort of low, as it would now be known as low cost housing for um, uh, garden cities and this sort of thing. But a delightful, delightful little church. Um, there's an old photograph of the uh, of the local crafts and building it. This, I think, in the in the local shop was a little sort of museum of its history. Very, very simple, plain interior, no, no particular reference back to medieval precedents. They obviously enjoyed designing the, the chancel roof. It's quite a, a feat of timber engineering. And at the West End, there's a little narthex. It's a complete, it's a complete church in, in miniature, tiny, but sort of perfectly formed. And um, well, lit with these um, the, the basically plain glass windows those that give lovely views out into the dales um, but or, or with reminders of, of why we're here the symbols of the passion um, in, in, in stained glass I, I don't know who did them but they they're very fine now now we're going to go head south again for we'll leave Yorkshire and we're going to go down to All Saints Brockhampton because this is arguably the most important arts and crafts church um, so, an interesting story um, Brockhampton Court was here, and uh, as was usually the case with a, with a big house, the the, the church was um, next door. So not very convenient for the villagers who had to traipse down the drive. Not very convenient for the people in the house because they had all these hoipoloi from the village trampling past their front door to get to church. So they decided they would provide a new church um, outside the estate on on the main road here. Now, the funny thing is, is that they don't seem to have had any particular affinity with the arts and crafts movement. Like, can't no one can really explain why they that they selected um, William Letherby to design this. Um, the, the only other slight clue is the the, the lodge um, across the which is for the for the big house was built at about the same time, and um, the, this was designed. By, Barry Parker, uh, who, who with George Unwin went on to um, great things in the sort of arts and crafts 
uh, settlement world that, that they of course came up to New Earswick and uh, did the early work there and then went in Garden City. So there was some arts and crafts connection, but very, very tenuous. Um, very interesting couple, these. Um, Arthur Foster was the younger son of the owner of the Black Dyke Mills. Um, and being the younger son, he, his, he was destined to go into the church. Um, uh, Alice uh, Madeline Jordan was the daughter of, of a very wealthy Boston businessman who owned uh, department stores and things in, in Boston. And we assume that they met because um, the, the Black Dyke Mills were supplying a lot of worsted fabric to uh, um, North America at the time. Anyway, they were duly married in, in Boston. And um, as you do, uh, uh, Alice's um, father basically gave them Brockhampton Court um, to be to be their home. I think he had actually bought the house earlier as um, because he fancied himself as a bit of an English gentleman as well as being an American millionaire. Um, so I don't think he bought the house for for the couple, but uh, as he already owned it, he gave it to them as a wedding present. Um, and so then, so then they've got to. De they decide they want a new church. Um, and uh, they, how are they? Get, what, what, how, how do you order? How do you go about ordering a church? How do you think? Well, what do we really want here? And I, I think that. Um, so Arthur Foster, when when he was. Uh, uh, or ordained, he had one of his parishes was um, a place called Wheat, just south of Litchfield, and this was the church that that he had there. And surprise, surprise, All Saints Brockhampton appears to me to be an almost exact copy of Weeford. So I I think that um, Arthur and Madden put their heads together and said, "Well, that church we had up in Weeford that that seemed to work pretty well. Why don't we just have a copy of that?" And so that's that's how it was arrived at. I'm, I'm not aware of any other explanation as to how this remarkable building came to be. This this tower, well, they didn't have a tower like this on the church at Weeford, but in other respects, the, all the dimensions are are very similar. Um, as as we can see, it's the, the the roofs are thatched, which is interesting. And when we go inside, oh, sorry, this is I, I think I think the best arts and crafts church souvenir mug based on Brockhampton. Um, inside, what really strikes us first of all is, is this roof, the, the ceiling, which is just bare concrete with a, with a board, shuttered board finish. Um, this may not be what you would expect to find in an arts and craft church, particularly with a thatch roof, but uh, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's very logical. So the, I, the idea is that we want to use local materials, we want to use local craftsmen, um, and so this isn't concrete that was brought in on a, on a ready mix wagon. This was mixed by hand by the local chaps uh, using local gravel and sand. And uh, they they just saw some boards to make the shuttering. And here you have an extremely durable, uh, substantial roof. Durable so long as you keep the rain off and stop the frost getting at it. Hence the thatch on the outside. And of course the thatch provides good insulation. So it's actually a, a, a very, very logical solution to the problem of how you roof for church like this. The, um, the, the roof is very steep. Um, Letherby had spent some time investigating um, domed construction uh, out, out in the Middle East. He'd studied um, Hagia Sophia and other churches with, with uh, domed and vaulted construction. So he felt very at home uh, designing like this. Um, but it did mean that because the uh, of the steep pitch, the the roof came down very low. So there wasn't room for you know a, a, a gothic windows. We, we the windows are, are very quite domestic in appearance, but but obviously liked the building very adequately. Again, of course, we're looking at <clears throat> a, a decoration ba based on natural themes. These are the, the front panels of the choir stalls, which were carved by another arts and crafts um, uh, person, George Jack, who uh, lectured in, in London and was sort of uh, all, all part of the arts and crafts group. So beautifully carved flowers and plants decorating the choir stalls. The, um, uh, the, the south window, uh, Christopher Wall, another arts and crafts 
stained glass designer um, and notice the diagonal tracery, which we'll come to in a minute. This So um, Letherby employed a young architect called Randall Wells as his assistant at uh, Rockhampton. Um, and uh, it, it is assumed or it's said that this the Lich Gate was designed by Randall Wells while, while he was there. And interestingly, we, out, just outside Exeter is, is a bus stop also designed by Randall Wells. This must have been later, I think, because I don't think they would have had bus stops when he was designing uh, this one. But anyway, here's a Randall Wells Arts and Crafts bus, bus shelter, uh, which makes me think of, well, you can have an Arts and Crafts railway station, can't you? This is the railway station at Port Sunlight that um, celebrated sort of Arts and Crafts uh, it's a new, new new village, and I I just mm, struck me that there were remarkable similarities between the railway station and St Matthews. No, um, as far as I know, there's no other connection than coincidence. Um, so we were at Brockhampton, just along the road, but very close by is um the village of Kempley, and um, Randall Wells having having sort of cut his teeth under Letherby at uh, Brockhampton um, got, got the job to design the new church for uh, for Kempley village. Um, <clears throat> there, there was an old church in the village, but it was uh, way out, way outside the village in a very damp setting. It actually has some quite uh, important um, murals. It's still there, but um, uh, the Lord of the Manor decided that a, a new church was was needed here. Um, so this was William Ligon, the seventh Earl Beecham, who, who was the patron. As I say, every arts and crafts church has a needs a good patron. He, he specifically chose this style for the west window. And as we've seen before, the there is no east window that the light all floods in the west end. So the focus is all on the altar. You're not distracted by an east window or other things. Uh, the altar is illuminated by this window in the in the south wall. Um, Lord Ligon was a was a, 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 a real high churchman. Um, this is the font that we saw when I, in, the, in the font section at the beginning. Um, so he wanted a, a, a proper medieval sort of rude screen. The bishop at the time didn't think this was really on in, a, in a, an Anglican church, so this wasn't put up initially, but subsequently uh, the bishop relented, or I think there was a new bishop so the, the these the carvings were organised by um, Randall Wells, uh, and they were carved not by a traditional uh, ecclesiastical sort of craftsman, but by a um, ship's figurehead carver. So it is said. So you can see that the, the, the figures are much more lifelike and, and realistic than most of, of this type of uh, statue. The, again, the the. the decoration using going back to, to nature and this was actually carried out by the architect himself and, and assistants and um, it, it, this all, all part of the idea that you, you know you, your architect is, is a hands-on um, craftsman as well as just being a, a designer and there's some gorgeous furniture there all part of the arts and crafts movement now we mustn't forget Wales, uh, very close to England, and there was a we share a lot in common. We have quite a few differences, um, and uh, of course, when you think of Wales, you really think of the chapel tradition. But if you're an English person living in Wales, you would you would like a little bit of um, home comfort, I suppose. And um, up at uh, at Brith Deer in the, in the north here, um, we, we find this astonishing little church. St Mark's, Brith Deer. So um, Wilson had worked with uh, John Dando Sedding at, on the other sort of so-called Cathedral of the Arts and Crafts movement, that's uh, Holy Trinity, Sloan Street. And uh, but he had this, he, he was really uh, keen on the idea that that architecture should harmonize with the surroundings um so you, you know you use local stone local slate and the, and the building grows out of the ground and and is is just part of the uh part of the, the context of life if you like um 
inside is is is, a, is such a contrast to the the rather um, plain and severe exterior. And and his vision was that the altar would be a jewel within within the mount of the of, of, of the building. Um, so of course we had to have a patron here, um, and uh, the, the, this is another um, very in intriguing story. Like so many of these arts and crafts patrons, they were all very interesting characters. So Louisa had married um, Mr. Richards, who who owned the the the, the, the big house nearby he he died and louisa subsequently married the reverend charles tooth um another interesting character that we assume they they might well have met at holy trinity sloan street they were both um in in london and that seems the sort of um high church church where they would both have been interested in going um charles tooth was the brother of arthur tooth who who was a very a very celebrated character the only the only uh cleric ever to be um uh tried under the public worship regulation act this was the act of parliament that um tried to ensure that uh the 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 church of england didn't sort of go over to rome and become too um too ritualistic um poor old arthur um uh, so he he he, le he left the church eventually and um uh, basically ran um a boys home and uh, rather more secular activities anyway um so Church charles he may he might he must they must have known he was he was uh unwell when they married within a few months of the marriage charles had had died and so Louisa basically built this church as a, as a memorial to him uh, and to provide a, um, somewhere in, in this part of Wales where there could be what, what she thought of was, was proper sort of high church worship in, in an area where basically the, the, the chapels ruled. Um, so the, this is the, the font. And again, we have a, a hands on architect here, Henry Wilson, beat the copper out to, to make the Alter frontal. Uh, here's um, Charles Tooth um, with his guardian angel and um, little angel here visiting the scene. Um, Wilson apologised to Louisa that this took him longer than he expected because the, the little child he was using as the model wouldn't keep still long enough for him to do it. Um, Wilson was very anti the, 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 the convention of the time, a, a, a you know, um, or the rail made of a fancy wrought iron and a brass top. He thought this was really not appropriate for, for a, a building like his. So he designed these very, very substantial um, arts and crafts altar rails. And of course, decoration is all themes from nature. This is the end of the choir stalls. And the carvers here were the, the Trask brothers from, uh, from Somerset. <clears throat> We, we must just nip back to Yorkshire. Um, so we're going to go to St. Wilfrid's at Halton on, on this side of Leeds. I expect many of you know this. You can see it going into Leeds on the train or you can see it from the from the A64. This is, so we're, we're into the 1930s. We've, we're through the First World War. We're into, you know, the modern movement is, is, is catching on. But Randall Wells, having worked at, uh, Kempley and um, Roker is appointed to design this remarkable, as it turned out, remarkable building. Not a, similar to anything we've seen before, but in the, in the spirit of the arts and crafts movement and um, decorated with uh, these interesting um, features which are sort of based on the the, the woodland industry, um, the spindles and bobbins and things as as would have been found in the, in the local industries. A um, couple of lovely arts and crafts, statues. And then of course, World War II. Is this the end of the arts and crafts movement? Well, I suppose really and truly it, it is. Uh, after World War II, materials were very scarce. Everything was rationed. Labor was short. 
you simply could not do the sort of things that that we've been looking at here except just quickly dashing back to edinburgh we, we, we have the robin chapel so the, the thistle foundation was a foundation set up um by the Tudsbury family um as a, they realized that um, th there were a lot of people who had been injured in, in the war. And uh, so often, if, if you were um, invalided, it was impossible to, to live at home. You'd end up in a, a sort of some sort of a common care accommodation separated from your family. So they established the Thistle Foundation um, to be a bit more like a, a college or, or sort of a series of almshouses um, where in wounded um, servicemen could live with their families in sort of sheltered accommodation. And in the center of the, of the foundation is the chapel, which was built in memory of their son, Paul Robin, who died just a few days before the end of the war. I mean, it's all unbelievably sad, but we do have a remarkable building as a result of it. This is the, a painting of the, the son, Robin. It's sort of collegiate style, again, going, like going back to Brampton. It's, it's somewhere where you come together as a community not somewhere where you where, where you come and, and God is far off in the uh, in the distance um, and of course being arts and crafts the decorations owes everything to nature and apparently um, the son Robin was a, was a great nature lover and so it's very appropriate that the decoration should all be in this style and of course being in Scotland we have some thistles to symbolize that um, the gorgeous metalwork here <clears throat> and a series of windows by uh, Sadie McClellan in a sort of arts and crafts style, uh, all based on the stories from the Pilgrim's Progress, which are very appropriate for the, given the uh, clientele of the church. And then, of course, you can buy the book if I've managed not to bore you too much. And... Um, We'll draw to an end there. Thank you very much for listening. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger. I can see there's already been one question from Barbara, um, and she asks, at the Carlisle Church, um, I don't know, read it. many of the interior walls you've shown are brightly decorated. Is the present colour scheme true to the original intention? Yes, I think because the, the all pretty well all of these churches are are uh, acknowledged as being uh, as being you know, very very important, and they have all been um, you know a lot of research has been done to make sure that they're getting the colours right and, and keeping them as they were originally intended. I think you'll find that's the case in almost all all of them, I, you know, and, and it's great that that this has been done. Yeah. Yes, no, there was, sorry, there was another question from Barbara. Perhaps you could say it, because I've lost it there. <laughs> Who had yes. to agree the design with the Carlisle yes. Church? Yes, it was a question about Carlisle Church. The, 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 one, at Bram, the one at Brampton, just outside yes. Carlisle. Yeah. So, so Barbara asks, who had to agree the design with the Carlisle Church? Was yes. he the lay rector? Did the bishop have to agree? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't just impose an arts and crafts church uh, <laughs> on your diocese willy nilly. You did have to get the um, the bishop and uh, the other. I, I presume the equivalent of the DAC in those days. <laughs> yes. I mean, you had to get. I mean, the, the the faculty system goes back, you know, hundreds of years. You would mm. have had to get a faculty. But I think if you were someone like. Um, uh, George Howard, you know, you could you could put a bit of pressure on the bishop to to say, you know, come on, we need to do it like this. We're, you know, give us the faculty, won't you? <laughs> I don't. I think this is the point. The, 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 uh, most of these patrons were pretty influential people, and so they could, um, you know, pull the strings to get what what they wanted. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, I'll pass it over to. Sylvia, who's masquerading as Tom Ramsden uh, here, <laughs> because Tom, our chairman, is, is away. And so Sylvia has kindly stepped in. She looks after the uh, grants for churches, so very important person in the uh, trust. So, 
Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Roger for a, a, a fascinating and interesting talk on such a great period for craftsmen and, as you said, for craftswomen. Um, and I think we, we're just really lucky that we can enjoy the decorative and the fine arts, as you describe. Um, and it's also fantastic to think that all the things that happened here uh, did influence uh, Europe and, and America, didn't they? Mm. So mm. Yes. it more or less started here. Um, so you know, it's, mm. it's really good that we can still go um, and see it. Um, I've been, been to the Roker Church. Um, I was born in Leeds, so I've been to Halton. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I've watched a spab lecture on the Brockhampton one. So all those, uh, it's good, <laughs> good to see all those churches again. Um, I think everything that the arts and crafts movement stands for, it's still of such importance today. Um, mm, absolutely. And, I, and it's really great that, that, there's, uh, that the uh, role of women had some input and was recognised you know, with Sarah and Phoebe and, and Mary. So I would like to learn a lot more about that as well. Um, I never knew, I've not heard yet about the Nine Orders of Angels as well, so I'll, I'll also have to look into that. <laughs> um, I think you must have had a fantastic time doing the research for this book, going to all those wonderful places. So I'd like to thank mm -hmm. you for all the research that you've done. Um, I hope some people will be interested in, in buying the book. And, and if, if we could all show Roger our um, appreciation by uh, giving him a clap, even if he can't hear them all. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for the time you spent with us tonight. It's been much appreciated. Yeah, and can I just add, um, if anybody's interested in getting the book, if you look on the website, Vanessa's going to put Roger's email address under the details of his talk so they can contact him. That was the, the arrangement. So Roger's address will be their email address. Right. Thanks very much, Roger. So, right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank See you, you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Bye.